the best organization to look for for fixing North American cities. Um, they take the financial angle, but they also take the, you know, there, there's just some regulations like Euclidean zoning that requires you to only build single family homes. Loosening up the zoning, the minimum parking requirements, the other things that make it hard to build walkable places, get rid of those things. Mm -hmm. And then put a much better traffic engineering um, regulations in about uh, and guidelines in to build safer streets and then, you know, wait 30 years. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's, that's really, yeah. the, that's the solution. <laughs> Jason Slaughter is a creator behind the channel, not just bikes. And on top of having an awesome name, he also has an awesome message that there are better, smarter ways to design our cities and live in them. If you haven't seen his channel, he examines how major cities, especially in the United States, have been designed for cars in pretty much the most wasteful ways possible. And if you have seen his channel, you know what I'm talking about. But he has a knack for kind of taking the world that many of us live in and never think twice about and deconstructing it in a way that makes you kind of see everything in a whole new way. And it makes you wonder why the hell we're doing things like this. People who get into his channel call it being orange pilled because his logo is orange. Uh, but it's an apt terminology because I think, you know, we, we kind of just accept the world around us the way it is. We don't really question it until somebody comes along and makes you question it. And you realize, oh, this is this is kind of dumb, <laughs> you know, uh, dumb and and new. We, we didn't always design cities like this. Sometimes the old ways of doing things are better, it turns out. But we talk about all this in the interview and we talked for a while. We actually go pretty deep on this and uh, I learned a lot about this stuff that I didn't really know before. So if you're a city planning nerd, I think you'll really like this. But anyway, enough of all that. I want to thank Jason for joining. I really had fun. But for now, sit back, relax and enjoy my conversation with Jason Slaughter. I did want to ask, I mean, um, uh, your thing with uh, with foreign. Yes. Has that come out? No, no. Okay. Uh, it's. Uh, I was going to say it's mostly his fault, but I guess it's my fault, too. Uh, I've been busy with, with another video. He's been busy with another video once mm. to get out soon. We're going to be working on it very shortly. Uh, okay. So I've, I've got another video that's coming out before it, and then I think it's the one after that. Um, but uh, he, he was kind of blown away by the whole experience uh, yeah. of, like, taking public transit in the place he had lived for the first time. Uh, as well as like seeing the downtown and everything, which he had, you know, he, he had driven through it a lot and he had been there when he was younger. And so for him to see it, like how much it's declined was really mm. kind of shocking to him. And so he wanted to do a lot more research into like what happened there and talk to some people. He wants to do some interviews with people. So I think it's going to be a little bit more involved than we thought it would be. Well, at least hmm. his his side of it. My My side's relatively straightforward, but the only point for my side of the collab video is to send people over to his channel. So, mm. you know, um, that's, that's interesting that, I mean, um, I used to, okay, I'll just get right into it. I live here in Dallas. Um, they have a decent public transportation system around here. Um, it's not great. They have but, the DART, um, right? Is that what it's called? DART. Yeah. And, um, back when I lived up in North Dallas and I worked downtown there, you know, the train station was right next to, you know, it was literally across the street from where I worked. And so I would take the train all the way down, beat the traffic and everything. Um, I hardly ever take it now just because it, it takes as long to get to the train station as it would to just go wherever it is I'm going, you know? Yep. yep. Um, so anyway, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I guess let's, let's jump into your story because I've always been curious. Um, you, you live in Amsterdam, right? I do live in Amsterdam, yes. Yeah. You, you have the strangest Dutch accent I've ever heard. <laughs> if I may say yes, so. Yes, indeed. It sounds almost like I'm from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so how'd you wind up there? Uh, yeah, so the the story is, I guess it depends where I want to start, but um, my wife and I were are both from Canada. We got, uh, we got together in Canada. We lived together in Canada. We got married in Canada. Um, but we wanted to live in other countries. So originally we moved to the UK. Uh, we went to Taiwan, uh, the UK again, Belgium. <clears throat> we had two kids. So um, we had been around in a bunch of different countries. I also had a job that required me to travel insane amounts, like just mm -hmm. absolutely insane amounts, um, more than anyone ever should, like traveling literally uh, a couple of times every week. I was on a plane. Oh, geez. And um, for the for a space of very, uh, several years, five or six years. And, um, and so I had a lot of experience living in other countries and then also visiting a lot of countries and a lot of cities. Um, 
And anyway, long story short, we uh, we were living in Belgium, but we we had our second child, and we thought, you know, we should really be closer to family. So we said we we're going to move back to uh, Toronto, and and we tried to do it as um, sort of European as possible. We lived like near a main street that had transit in a streetcar suburb, mm-hmm. um, and uh, but it was it was like quite a bit of reverse culture shock coming back to Canada after living and traveling to so many other places in the world. And, um, and I don't know, I couldn't handle it. I lasted about a year. Uh, my wife was like, come on, we got to give it a better try than that. <laughs> she did a bunch of advocacy work. I was a little bit in the advocacy stuff. She went hard into the advocacy stuff. Eventually she got tired of it too. And she said, okay, we, we can't do this. Like we, we had gotten a taste for what it's like to live in really good walkable mm-hmm. cities with good public transportation. And, uh, when we couldn't go back. So, mm-hmm. um, so we were looking at like, where would we go? Because we can't just keep jumping around when we have kids. So my, my wife and I agreed that the next move was going to be our last move. So we did a bunch of research. We had been to most places that you'd want to live anyway. Uh, so it was really just going there and really evaluating it as, is this the place that we could live for, you know, the, the foreseeable future? And eventually we settled on the Netherlands for various reasons. And so we moved to the Netherlands. And then when we had lived in different countries, we always had a blog that, uh, you Mm -hmm. know, where we talked about our experiences with that place. And um, we had done that in Taiwan and in Belgium and and the UK. And um, and so we were thinking of doing the same thing here in the Netherlands. But like who starts a blog in 2018? So so I decided (laughs) to start a YouTube channel instead, talking about like the reasons why we like the Netherlands. And the goal was just to be uh, just for other people who maybe hadn't traveled as much as as we had as much as i had um to share the experiences that i had um and uh and it was really it like other people who were looking at interesting places to live in the world i was like here here's what i know and here's why we chose the netherlands and Uh i was gonna make i don't know 10 or 12 videos it was just for fun but uh obviously it kind of took off to, to say the least um and it became like wildly popular and so after I finished talking about the first 10 or 12 videos, I started talking about some other things about urban planning that I had learned over the years. And I mean, that's where we are today. Now, mm-hmm. a channel with almost, I'm looking here, 900,000 subscribers, uh, you know, within the space of like three years. So pretty good. Yeah, it's well, been kind of crazy, to be honest. Yeah, totally. And, and not just um, a lot of subscribers, but a lot of um clout for 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 lack of a better word like i mean you you were saying a second ago you get on newscasts all the time people call you up like you're you're a figurehead for this like movement that's going on sort of yeah it's i think it's kind of bizarre it's a it's more than a youtube channel there's definitely a movement behind Mm -hmm. it the fans talk about being orange pilled by my content i love that Um, (laughs) i'm so jealous i want a pill (laughs) where's my pill exactly like once once they've been orange pilled they never see their city the same way again like the the streets that they always would go down then now they know what a strode is they can't ever look back um and yeah there's been definitely a bit of a movement around it i think some of that is um is the fact that this is the first time there's a a lot of my audience tends to be younger like probably under 35 i'd say on a lot of under 30s too um and they're sort of hearing this stuff for the first time and a Mm -hmm. lot of things they hated about the suburb they grew up in is finally clicking like why they hated it Mm -hmm. that you know uh, uh my content's able to put um, the vocabulary to the feelings they've had. Yeah, yeah. But I think some of it was also just really good timing because with, um, uh, you know, as bad as it sounds with COVID, it was good, good timing for the channel because uh, there were a lot fewer cars on the road during COVID. There were a lot of cities that were, you know, removing parking spaces <clears throat> to make patios. Uh, there was a lot of temporary pop-up bike infrastructure and stuff to get people off of public transit and, and into onto bikes and stuff like that. And so I think there was a lot of discussion around that and then with Mm. the channel you know starting around that time it started in um, october of 2019 Uh, i think that was also just very good timing for people to you know to see all these things that are happening around them to see wow this is so much better why is this and then here's a youtube channel that sort of presents it to them as to no this is this is why it's so much better so you, you mentioned the orange pill thing. I was I was gonna. I mean, I've had I've heard other people say that like after watching your videos or you know going through your channel, they just see the world differently. Like you're actually changing yes. people's worldviews with with your channel and stuff. And I, I guess I was gonna ask 
if you had an orange pilled moment yourself, but I guess, <laughs> I guess that's kind of, um, what you just said, like you, you moved away and then you came back and it was kind of like, yeah. Ooh, I didn't notice how <laughs> crappy this was until you got away from it. Yeah. I think, um, I think, I don't know if there was a, a single moment, but there were, there were several, um, experiences I had that really stuck with me. Um, certainly that one about, you know, moving back to Canada. And even though we tried to live in an old streetcar suburb, the, the car dependency of the rest of the region, the, the greater Toronto area, mm -hmm. you started to feel it after a while, right? Like you started to feel like you were st still a second class citizen or worse, um, if you were walking or cycling. Um, and, and the way people treated you was, um, you know, and then there were drivers that just would, you know, plow through red lights or try mm -hmm. to run, run me off the road when I'm cycling. And, and I think a lot of that was really eye opening because I don't think I realized that uh, because, you know, before we went, I, I hadn't gotten used to the idea of the walkable cities. And then when, you know, when we'd come back to visit, you know, you, you just, you know, you, you're driving around to somebody's house, a family's house or something. But it wasn't until we moved back there that it was really shocking. And then there's been some other times too. Like I made that video um, about. Nope. video. Um, and, uh, and it uh, it was also one where you know I wanted to walk 800 meters and basically couldn't uh, in, in in the suburbs of Houston, and that oh, was also yeah, an eye opening yeah. experience because I was like, well, what do you mean I can't walk 800 meters? Like it's just it's yeah, that was mind blowing, which is which is why I made a video that that talked about that. Um, mm. that specific is it because they use feet well. in me in in Houston? And <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, okay. It's 800 yards approximately <laughs> for <laughs> you Americans, right? <laughs> Um, it's funny that you, you say that because, like, I first of all, all the traveling you've done, I'm totally jealous. I've uh, my wife and I both were always like, you know, we want to live at least some portion of our lives in a place outside of the United States or some place where they yeah. don't speak English as a primary language or something. It just feels like an important experience to have, you know. Well, I mean, I recommend it to absolutely everybody who has the ability, and I know it's quite a yeah. privilege to be able to move to different countries, That's but true. I think the one thing that can be done is if you're a student and there's any opportunity for an exchange program to another mm -hmm. country, do it. Like, absolutely do it. It's, yeah. it's very eye-opening. Yeah, I always talk about how actually isolated we are here. Uh, I mean, you're from Canada, but from the United States, like, you know, we got oceans on both sides of us, and yeah. to the north, we're culturally not too distinct, you know, or indistinct, yeah. and... Yeah. Um, so we just kind of like accept the world the way it is. And it's, you got to step outside of that to really, to really see it. Um, well, yeah, America is quite insular. I mean, your news tends to talk about America doesn't talk an awful lot about the rest of the world. Uh, in, in Canada, there is more international news, although mm -hmm. a lot of, um, a lot of news is still about the United States. Even international news <laughs> is about the United States. Right. And, and yeah. the United States and Canada are not that different as, as you said, um, culturally and in many other ways. They're really not that different. I think Canadians like to play up the difference between Americans and Canadians. But the, the truth is, they're not very much. I remember <laughs> the first time I lived outside of Canada, I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, it was basically the same. Like, people had the same <laughs> accent as me. I mean, they said hella. But, you know, other than that... <laughs> <laughs> which I did start adding to my vocabulary. But, yeah. but you know, other than that, the cities look the same. That You know, we drove all the same cars. We spoke the same language with the same accent. We watched most of the same television. You know, mm -hmm. it was all it was all very, very samey. And here, here it is, you know, whatever it is, the other side of the continent. And these people are basically the same as me. I think it would have been, the people would have been more different if I had gone to the south of the United States. But but regardless, the, the there's not a huge difference in, in culture, behavior, cities across North America, well, across the U.S. and Canada, I should say. Obviously, Mexico yeah, is quite yeah. different. Um, yeah, and 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 like Canadians make fun of Americans for not having a passport. Like, there's a large number of Americans who don't have a passport, but I feel like most of the Canadians who have a passport only got it to go to the United States. So I don't think they can really <laughs> talk much. It is true, though. You're quite isolated geographically. Like, mm -hmm. it's a it's a long flight. It's a and it's expensive just to go anywhere. That yeah. would be substantially different. Whereas from here. I can get on a train, for example, for a few hours and be somewhere very, very different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, different language, different architecture, different all sorts in different all sorts of ways, different foods. Yeah, um, and that's just not possible in in the U.S. or Canada. 
So in this conversation, we're talking a lot about mobility, and we are becoming a much more mobile society. Um, I know a lot of people are working from home now these days, maybe taking the old laptop to the coffee shop, which I like to do, but the more you get around with your computer, the more you're exposing yourself to possible online threats, which is why you should seriously consider getting some kind of protection, like today's sponsor, NordVPN. Like, there's this tactic called middle menning, I just found out about, where, where people will set up a Wi-Fi signal disguised as a legit signal in whatever public place you might be in. So you sign up with it, thinking it's the legit Wi-Fi service, and then they have access to all your data. Scary stuff. But what NordVPN does is it kind of flips it on those people who want to attack your data by making your computer look like it's somewhere else so they can't get in. It's pretty smart. But that's just the start. NordVPN also offers threat protection. So if you accidentally click on any links that happen to install malware on your computer, it'll put a stop to that. It'll just stop it at its source. And the dark web monitor will also let you know if any of your passwords or your credentials ever get leaked anywhere. So you can keep track of that as well. And then there's that fun trick of, you know, being able to watch stuff on Netflix that you can't find here because your VPN makes you look like you're in another country. I mean, that's a sweet life hack. Each account protects up to six devices, and they've got 24-hour support if you're new to VPNs and feel a little intimidated by it all. Plus, they've got a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you don't like it, you're not stuck with it. Booyah. So just go to nordvpn.com cwj to get started, and if you sign up at that link, uh, you'll get a number of months for free. It's, it's kind of a random drawing thing. Might be a few months, might be a year. You might get a whole year. No promises, though, because it's random. That's how random this works. But you'll get something. Either way, it's a great deal, and it's a great service. Trust me, this isn't something that you want to learn the hard way. So do it. Go protect yourself. That's nordvpn.com slash cwj. It'll protect you and help support this podcast. So thanks to NordVPN for supporting this episode. Now, back to Jason. And in Texas, growing up in Texas, sadly living my whole life in Texas, um, it, it was a big deal to leave the state. <laughs> Right. I mean, it was, yeah, it was, I mean, a, it was a whole huge. thing just to leave the state, you know. I've driven across that state. It took me a long time. To get to Houston? <laughs> <laughs> no, I flew into Houston, but I okay. actually had, um, there was one time where I, I drove across the country several times because I, I used to do um, internships when I was in university. And I worked three internships in California, but all three times I drove there oh, um, because you basically couldn't live without a car. Um, mm -hmm. So I borrowed my parents' car for the for the four months, or one of my parents' cars, because they had two, of course, because they lived somewhere car dependent. Um, so I drove across the United States, uh, and I drove a different interstate each time. And one of the times I drove across I-40, across Texas, and mm -hmm. it was in the middle of a snowstorm. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. <laughs> you guys we have a snowstorm right now. Snow. It's falling right now, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah? That's yeah. amazing. Oh, my God. I had never in my life seen so many pickup trucks in the ditch it was, <laughs> it was phenomenal and i'm driving this this oldsmobile and i'm like guys you have no idea what you're doing but yeah. i see them just zooming down the just zooming down the highway and they're four by four and then they go off in the ditch and i'm like i, it, I it can't stop a, and help you guys i gotta get back to canada like yeah. it was crazy actually there, there's a law in texas that every uh pickup truck has to have a switch in it that whenever the snow starts falling it just it just immediately veers off into a ditch to clear the roads you know it makes it easier yeah, right. so yeah it's it, it all makes it was sense. absolutely ridiculous how many truck pickups i saw in the ditch during that drive <laughs> it was just mind-boggling but anyway well so texans don't have to drive in the snow kind of going back just a little bit to the, to being yeah. in texas and well no because like america is isolated and then Texas is like isolated inside of isolation. You know, like we are yeah. just, I mean, most, most Texans identify as Texans before they identify as Americans, you know? Right. And right. Um, kind of what you were saying about leaving and coming back and being like, whoa, I never realized. Um, uh, a a sister-in-law of mine, or a, sorry, a stepsister. I can't, my family's weird. Um, she uh, lived in Texas her whole life. She got married to a military guy. He got stationed in Missouri for a while. So they went to Missouri for right. a couple of years or whatever. And, and I remember like we were, um, you know, hanging out at Christmas or whatever. And, and she was, she was like, I never realized how everything in Texas is all about Texas until I lived at somewhere else, you know? But like in Texas, you got Texas toast. You got, you know, the Texas branded F-150. You got like, everything is just like Texas, Texas. Um, I'm not kidding. There was an Ozarka uh, water commercial. The, the, I used to work in advertising, so I, I pay attention to ad copy or whatever, but the, 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 the only word in the entire commercial was the word Texas. 
<laughs> it would just show a picture of like a cowboy, Texas. And then a picture of the Rio Grande, Texas. And then a picture of Reunion Tower, Texas. And then like a picture of Ozarka Springwater, Texas. Nice. And I was just like, associate the name of the state with your product. Exactly. Done. That was the only word in the entire commercial was just Texas. Uh, I was like, oh, my God, you got to be kidding me. It's like, do do, do they get these kind of commercials in Nebraska? Nebraska. Nebraska. Probably not. But, you know, I don't know. I've only ever driven through Nebraska. I remember uh, (laughs) driving through Nebraska was exactly like driving through Kansas, but it smelled like cow shit. (laughs) (laughs) Kansas didn't? Kansas did not smell like cow shit. What no, does Kansas maybe it was just like? the part of Kansas I drove through. It was mostly, I mean, it was very flat. It was mostly mm. just wheat fields. It was more like driving through Saskatchewan. Same mm. thing. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, I just lost all my Kansas viewers. I don't know how many I've had. Well, I think it was Nebraska was worse there. I think Kansas, Kansas is flat and kind of boring, but, uh, you know. At least the entire like Midwest, I just lost all of them. Maybe. Well, yeah. I'm from Texas, so they probably hate me anyway. But. Yeah, that's true. Um, and I, so, I'm a dirty European now, so. No. <laughs> so, well, so, okay, the reason I'm kind of leaning on the whole, like, you know, um, isolation thing and, like, everything kind of being different, you just like, kind of accept that as you, as you grow up somewhere. Um, I feel yeah. like that ties a big part into why um, there is such difficulty getting walkable cities and walkability into the cities that already exist in in places in the united states you know like i i think it's really cool that people are seeing your videos and they're and they're like oh i never really thought about it this way or i've never i've never yeah. seen it this way before yeah um but what can actually be done about it in places that were like built <clears throat> over a hundred years to be all about the cars you know yeah well um I mean, I don't have a great solution to that. If I had the answer to that, I wouldn't have had to leave. So that's <laughs> unfortunately the real truth of it. Yeah. But but the thing is, um, I don't think people appreciate the history of it, that the United States was built on walkable cities. Every, every major city in the United States was once a walkable mm. city built around a train station, all of them. With the only exception, the only major city that was accepted from that was Phoenix, um, which was built long after automobiles were available. And I mean, it does have a downtown, but not in the same way the rest. But certainly yeah. if you look at any other city and Houston included, and I talked about this in my Houston video, I show pictures of what Houston looked like in the 1920s and it was unrecognizable. Yeah, it, You yeah. know, they there, there were street cars running down the street and there were, you know, all these nice uh, shops and houses with pops, houses above them. And it was all walkable. Um, and I think um, what, what's really happened in the United States is, is, and I get this all the time, people say, oh, you know, the U.S. is designed for the car, or it'll be like, oh, the U.S. is too big for this. We need to drive. But that, that's not true at all. The U.S. did have walkable cities, that, and, and, and the entire country was built on trains. Um, and that, that's the way it worked for a very long time, mm-hmm. like from the invention of trains until those things were torn out. But that happened in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, right? Yeah. Like, if you look at American cities before that, it wasn't that long ago, uh, you know, a couple of generations that, um, that yeah, you could have walked to a train station and hopped on a train and gone almost anywhere in the country. That was that was perfectly normal. And, and really, I think when it comes to car dependency in the United States, if you're looking at your downtown areas, um, some of them were just bulldozed, and that's just the mm-hmm. way it went. And pretty much every uh, American city had urban freeways run through it, and freeways should not run through into cities. Yeah. And what you'll see often in Europe is you'll have like a, a ring road that goes around it, but the, the, the freeway doesn't go into the city. Um, and the original uh, Interstate Highway Act uh, didn't have that. It was just supposed to connect between cities. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was supposed to be that the city would still be there. The city would still have its train station and its normal roads and everything. And then on the outskirts of the city, there'd be an interstate that would take you to the outskirts of another city. But I think that was one of the things that really destroyed urbanism in the United States was the urban freeways. Um, And and I think when you look at uh, how many walkable places there are in a city in the United States, what it really comes down to is how much was destroyed versus, versus how much was preserved. So. In a lot of cities in the Northeast, for example, if you if you go somewhere like uh, like Philly um, and Philadelphia, uh, 
there's quite a lot of walkable neighborhoods still left, and that's simply because they weren't bulldozed. But if you go down to, say, downtown Houston, there's a huge amount that was bulldozed. Uh, or Denver is another example where a huge amount was bulldozed. And so I think when people say, oh, we can't be walkable for whatever reason, whatever reason they pull out, whether it's the weather or the size of the country or, or anything like that, it's, it's really just shows a lack of understanding of history. Um, and that stuff was destroyed and it could be put back. There's no reason why it couldn't be put back except for uh, political will. And I think that's, that's the trick, right? Now, of course, since the 1950s, there's been huge sprawling suburbs built around pretty much every American city. And those were built to be car dependent right from the start. And some of those can be you know, repaired. Uh, but a lot of them simply can't, and that's just not going to change, unfortunately. But, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to the downtown areas of pretty much any American city, we could turn back the clock, and we could do it. It's just, it's going to take political will. It's going to take changing a bunch of the laws that were put in place, you know, like minimum parking requirements, where mm -hmm. every building needs to have a certain number of parking spaces added to it. We need to remove those regulations. And, and let those cities come back. Uh, but again, it, it really does come down to political will. And I guess that's the trick with the channel. Um, <laughs> the, I was never very good at, 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 at being an advocate because I felt like I had done the research, I had talked to urban planners, I had learned all this stuff, and I thought, you know, pre presenting this information, people would get it. And if they didn't, I would just call them stupid. And that's <laughs> generally not the best thing for an advocate to do. <laughs> that's not the best way to win people over. <laughs> no, but I guess with, with the channel, I think I'm orange pilling so many people that, that you know, a lot of them are saying that uh, they're doing things in their community. You know, the, I say the, I get emails literally, DMs literally multiple times a day from mm -hmm. people saying, oh, you know, I've decided, you know, I can't move to Europe. I've decided to change this and become an advocate for that. Uh, the thing that really scares me is how many people tell me they've gone into urban planning because of me, which is cool, really awesome. But I was never an urban planner. I never went to school for urban planning. So I just hope they like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to ask you that. Yeah. I didn't know if that was in your background or not. It's not. I have a degree in electrical <clears throat> engineering and I worked mostly in the semiconductor industry and later on in my, in my career in the software industry. Mm. So um, in product management. So no, this was just a um, a hobby of mine because I wanted to understand why different cities were the way they were. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started learning about urban planning. I learned about Strong Towns, the nonprofit organization that really highlights the issues with um, the post-war development pattern in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, they look at it from a fiscal conservative point of view, and yet they come to a lot of the same conclusions I did, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. Um, I'm not an expert in it re remotely, but I, I have gotten really interested in, in urban planning in the last five or so years for some reason. Um, like City Beautiful is another channel yeah, that, that covers City that. Of, great. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, and there's a buddy of yeah, He's an actually. actual urban planner, actually. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. <laughs> City Beautiful Dave is an actual urban planner. So go listen to him. <laughs> yeah, totally. No, he's, he has, I love his channel. Um, uh, so to go back for just a second, we were talking about like how everything kind of changed from being um, uh, train centric to car centric, for lack of a better word. Um, that was like a coordinated effort, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, it, there's a lot of elements there, and I don't think, uh, you, you know, you, you look at the great streetcar conspiracy, as it's called, where uh, GM and Firestone and yeah. started a, a company um, that, that bought what, up all um, of the um, tram lines. And then the, what, who Chinatown? Framed Roger Rabbit? And Who Framed Roger Rabbit, yeah. Who Framed Roger Rabbit yeah. is about that, yeah. Um, and that <laughs> definitely know, did happen. went so deep? Yeah, exactly. I, it's, a, it's a complicated story, though. I mean, the thing was that... Um, uh, the public transit systems in the United States were mostly, they, they were government run back when you go back, you know, 100, 120 years ago kind of thing. They, they weren't government run. They were all private organizations and they had deals with the city to run their public transportation systems. And what happened in, in a lot of cases is they had agreed on a fare, like five cents for a trolley ride. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was before inflation was a thing. So then inflation took off inflation became a thing uh, but their contracts all said you know they had fixed rates for their um for their fares and it was difficult for them to change and so and also because you know as as it goes with private organizations running transit or any kind of as you see with your your um your your rail system in the united states for cargo um private companies are allergic to investing in infrastructure 
Uh, you mm -hmm. know, they're very happy to have the infrastructure and then operate it and make a bunch of money. But paying for infrastructure, who wants to do that? So the trolley systems were struggling a lot in the United States in the early in the early 1900s uh, to begin with. Um, but then, of course, yes, the the car companies did absolutely come along and, and run them out of business on purpose. So mm -hmm. they bought up these these um, these companies uh, with the goal of replacing them with buses because they didn't make they didn't make trolley cars, they, but they did make buses. And yeah. so they thought, you know, we'll we'll buy up all these trolley companies, rip out all the tracks so that they can never come back. Um, even though ripping up the tracks was horrendously expensive, they did it so that it, they could never come back. And then they replaced all of those public transit systems with buses. And it's really sad because at one point in time, Los Angeles had the largest electric streetcar network in the world. Hmm. Um, and actually, basically every single city in the United States had uh, had streetcars. They all did. Um, every single last one of them. And um, with very few exceptions, like I was even talking to Chuck, who runs uh, Strong Towns, Chuck Marone, and like Brainerd, Minnesota had a had a trolley line. Like Brainerd, Minnesota, which is still yeah. only, I don't know, like 12,000 people or, or maybe it's even less. I don't know. But it was it's not a lot of people and they yeah. still had a trolley line. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so the the public transit was like dismantled in the United States. Yeah. And, and there certainly was uh, an element of a conspiracy there for sure. But at the same time, when you look back uh, in the post World War Two period in any country and the Netherlands is included in this, Pretty much everybody was looking at cars as, as the way of the future, mm. right? Like yeah. I, I recently made a video where I took a piece of GM propaganda and kind of dissected it, um, a, a film they made in 1954. Um, that's, that's talking about how you should bug your politicians for to build more roads. And um, the general consensus at the time was that, you know, cars were the way of the future. They were going to be the freedom that gets you point A to point B. And, um, and, and they did in certain cases, certainly. Um, they were better than taking public transit. I think the thing with cars is that um, I think it's just we, we kind of went overboard on it. I think uh, motor vehicles are obviously incredibly useful. But mm. when everybody has to drive everywhere all the time, that's when the problems start. I mean, the problems have never really been with cars. The problem is with car dependency. Mm. Um, and that's what the United States became, um, where the majority of people live in a place where they... They cannot work, uh, get to work. They cannot even feed themselves without getting in a car. And, mm -hmm. and that's fundamentally a problem. So I, I think it's one of these things where, you know, a, a new fancy technology, the automobile comes along and highways come along and, and everyone went all in on it, which I think they just got a little overexcited about it and, yeah. and threw away everything else. I mean, if, if you had gone back and, and when, I, when I look at films and I, and I read newspaper articles from the Netherlands, in the 1960s, politicians would talk about like, oh, my God, you know, here we are with this country with people still riding around on bicycles. And we're the in, like yeah. the laughing stock of the world. And they would literally say, like, we got to get rid of these like rodents and insects, you know, talking about cyclists that way. Um, <laughs> and, and, and saying, you know, they were bringing American traffic engineers over because that was the way of the future. Right. Like this yeah. is the, we got to we got to get into we got to become a 20th century country we can't just keep riding around on bicycles all the time and the netherlands was not unique in the number of people riding bicycles like until around the 19 mid 1970s there were more people riding bicycles in the united kingdom than there were in the netherlands um and 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 in the united states too like people used to get around on bikes too in the in the first half of the, of the uh, 1900s and so that wasn't a unique thing um but i think uh i think the big difference the netherlands made is that in the 1970s, in the late 1970s, they started realizing that this wasn't working. Like having everybody in a car all the time was going to be a problem. And, and they started changing that. And it certainly wasn't a unanimous thing. You, you can look back on the newspaper articles at the time, and there were lots of people that thought it was absolutely ridiculous that we would not let everybody drive everywhere all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's just that they they realized it. First of all, they hadn't bulldozed a, as much of their cities. They hadn't got a chance to because they were poor after the war. Um, and then they stopped a little earlier than, than other people. They realized the mistake a little earlier. And I really think that's that's the difference. So the kind of realizations that people are just now coming to in 2023 in the United States, they came to in the 70s. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it was, it was two things that came together. And actually, it happened in other countries too. But uh, 
it just happened to reach like a critical mass in the Netherlands. There were there were two things that came together. First was the the OPEC oil crisis in oh, the 1970s, right, yeah. right? I mean, that happened everywhere. Yeah. Um, in the United States, the only lasting thing you have from that is uh, right turn on a red. So <laughs> if you could turn right <laughs> on a red light so that you wouldn't idle for as long. That, that's what you got out of the OPEC oil crisis. Nice. For a while, you got really fuel efficient vehicles. And, and then since around the, the 2000s, they've all become huge SUVs again. But, yeah. Uh, but anyway, so there was the OPEC oil crisis. And then the other thing was there was a an advocacy group called uh, Stop the Kindermord, which literally means stop killing children. Um, oh people were getting fed up with with kids being killed by cars. And so they started there were a bunch of advocacy groups, but eventually that was the one that resonated the most with people. Um, and uh, and so between the oil crisis, they started doing, you know, like car free Sundays so that uh, everywhere mm. was car free to save gasoline. And then people were saying, like, this is ridiculous that um, that children are being killed by cars. And and that started to convince people to change things. And again, it was not unanimous. It's not like everyone in the Netherlands was suddenly, uh, you know, like sure. was enlightened and was like, yes, let's change all this. When you look back at it, a lot of the plans, like even to run a highway through the center of Amsterdam, lost um, they the, the they they lost the votes in um in the city council by like one or two votes. It was not not anywhere close to an unanimous mm -hmm. thing. But what was decided is that um, is that there would be some restrictions on cars in, in terms of their speed, where they were allowed to go within cities, and, and the roads were made safer. Uh, and that was it. And what I find interesting about the history of, of the Netherlands is that nowhere in there did people say, we need to make it safe to cycle or ride a bike. No, but nobody was saying that at all. Hmm. Um, what happened was that everybody agreed enough people agreed that they were going to make the roads safer. And so there was a, a um, federal level uh, guidelines on, on road design. And that was really it. But what happens when you slow the cars, when you have fewer cars, um, suddenly people come out walking, suddenly people come out cycling. Uh, and so in the 80s, they were still taking out bike lanes in Amsterdam. Uh, oh, wow. You know, it was still that that case in the 80s. It wasn't really until the 90s that there was like enough critical mass of people cycling that they started demanding safer infrastructure. Huh. And you still see some of the infrastructure around here from the 90s because it takes time. Um, so really, all they really did was change their road design guidelines to make it the road safer. And then over the course of the next 30 years, you know, every road needs to be resurfaced approximately every 30 years. So if you've got new road design standards, you yeah. put those in place and within 30 years, you've got a new new country for, for free, effectively, right? Like people ask, how did they afford to build all this stuff? It's like you got to resurface the road anyway. So when you rebuild it, how are you going to rebuild it? And if you rebuild it safer, then you get all this for free. That's super interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's the story of how it all happened in a nutshell. I mean, I think well, I mean, there's more to it. Uh, so a lot of the protests were not peaceful. And I think that's one thing that's that's skipped over by a lot of people. There were literal riots in the streets um, mm -hmm. over some of these things about bulldozing people's houses and things like that. But sure, um, sure. Um, but yeah, that's that's how it happened. And so, you know, when you look to solving the problems of, of American cities and Canadian cities, I think um, it, no, nothing is going to happen overnight. It's a slow thing mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but, you know, if you look to strong towns, uh, and I think they are the, the best organization to look for, for fixing North American cities, um, they take the financial angle, but they also take the, you know, there, there's just some regulations like Euclidean zoning that requires you to only build single family homes, loosening up the zoning, the minimum parking requirements, the other things that make it hard to build walkable places, get rid of those things mm -hmm. and then put a much better traffic engineering um, regulations in about uh, and guidelines in to build safer streets and then you know wait 30 years <laughs> i mean <laughs> that's that's really yeah. the, that's the solution <laughs> yeah are you enjoying this conversation with jason does it make you want to check out his channel and watch his videos on these subjects and would you rather prefer to watch these videos without a bunch of ads well you can do exactly that on nebula or maybe you like the channel City Beautiful and his take on urban planning. Well, he's also on Nebula. Or maybe you like City Nerd. He's also on Nebula. Or RM Transit. Dude, you could watch for an entire week, spending just watching nothing but city planning videos on Nebula and not see a single ad. Plus, you know, many of these creators include extra content on their Nebula videos, and they make full videos and series that are only available on Nebula. 
And that's just one specific category of content creators. We also have film and TV analysts, channels on politics and society, science creators out the wazoo. Basically, if you like fun informational channels, there's hundreds of them ad-free, and you can see them earlier than everybody else on Nebula. I'm on Nebula, both my main channel and this podcast, where you can get the audio version ad-free and the video version a week early. Um, it's also where I have two, count them, two original series, my Mysteries of the Human Body series and my Forgotten Atrocities series, both of them not available anywhere else. In fact, and I, I mentioned City Beautiful a minute ago. He has an original series called Great Cities, and he just released one on Venice that's definitely worth checking out. And the reason we do this is because it's a place that we can call our own outside the confines of the almighty algorithms. So everybody who signs up for Nebula helps all of us be more sustainable in our channels and it frees us up to make videos that we really care about. So if you're the type of person who can afford to help support the creators you love, this might be the best way to do it because with one small fee, you're not just supporting one creator, you're supporting a whole community of creators. So if you've never considered Nebula, I hope you'll think about it. Maybe go check it out over at nebula.tv slash conversations with Joe. If nothing else, you'll be able to listen to the next episode without hearing me talk about Nebula. So there's that. Um, but yeah, that's my spiel about Nebula. One more time, if you're interested, it's nebula.tv slash conversations with Joe. Thanks for checking out. And now back to Jason. Um, I love the politics of <laughs> making it about killing kids. Yes. Because like, yes. oh, you want cars? I mean, you must want children to die. I know. It's, the, know. it's the think about the children angle, right? Yeah. But, you know, it, the reason people do it is because it works. Yeah. Well, it's that sort of like um, just over the top rhetoric, which the other side employs all the time. There was something I saw. I think I think it was a Climate Town video that was talking about this. That was, um, uh, I guess, when California passed some some regulations on fuel efficiency standards um there were these commercials that they're like they want to put things in your car to monitor how you drive and I, like just all no, the right. there there's a police state and all this and it's like no we just want cleaner cars it's not they're you know. literally yeah i mean they're literal lies uh, uh, that was in the in the most recent climate town video uh, climate town is a fantastic channel by Dude, the way so if funny. anyone listening to this is not watching them I'm, I'm actually mad that he's so funny he makes me furious <laughs> i know right um, you know it's i did a collab with him um when he was a much smaller channel because my wife and i would watch it and uh, and i remember she would say she said to me once um i'm watching climate town videos like why can't you be funny like <laughs> Well, why not? Anyway. Yeah, I know, right? Come on. Actually, I mean, just the little things. The, like, um, I love... He, he he takes his microphone and just, like, tapes it on his yeah, shirt. Yeah, but purposely tapes it with a blue tape. With a big like, blue... So yeah, the, and I don't even know how that works. It would just come right off, wouldn't it? Like, I think he's actually pinning it underneath, but he puts yeah. it on. <laughs> and, and, and there's uh, been some times where he's shirtless and just has it pinned to his chest. Uh, or <laughs> tape, taped to his chest. It's all hilarious. Oh, my yeah. God. Climate Town is great. So, yeah, we did a collab together ages ago. And, um, and yeah, the only goal of my video was to send people to his channel. And then his video ended up being way more popular than mine was. So, you know, that was, that was great. Yeah. You're like, his, you're welcome. His collab that we did was really good. Really, really good. I don't no, think I've seen that. I'll go check it out. people back to me. Yeah. No, it's good. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, we talked about the history of suburbs and mm. oh, it was really good. How far back was that? About a year ago a now, year? I think. Oh. Yeah. I think it must have been about that long, right? I don't know. I, yeah, it, it, all, it all blurs together. You know, know. The, the thing with being a YouTuber is that um, you're on like this never ending hamster wheel. Um, I actually tried to take a break. I did take a break over um, over December and January and part of January. Because, you know, when you get one video out, you're like, yeah, the video's out. And then you're like, I should be working on my next video. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How it often really do you is, post? Like, like a monthly or? Well, so when the channel started, I did every two weeks. Yeah. And it's really funny because. Um, I was always sticking to that two weeks, no matter what, um, even though like nobody was watching it, you know, mm -hmm. I would get a few hundred views or maybe a thousand views or 2000 on a really good video. And you're like, yes. And I was like, and I was like, I got, I got to make my two weeks. Mm -hmm. My wife's like, I, who cares? No, nobody, nobody cares about when you put videos out. Like they're not paying attention. Yeah. You don't have any like fans. <laughs> she was correct but i felt like i just had to do my two weeks i remember we were on um on christmas vacation and i was gonna miss my two weeks i had to make something so i was like i was like uh, we were saying this airbnb so i'm thinking oh putting out the garbage i haven't had to do that i'm gonna make this video about garbage day <laughs> and so i slapped it together in literally a day and a half yeah 
uh, I ran out and filmed some stuff with my phone and put it out. And it was my first video to hit a million views. So. Of course. There you go. Of yeah. course. It's the ones course, you just throw that together that, that yeah. like, yeah. I know. It's so funny. But anyway, so I used to do every two weeks. And then after a while, and the, the channel became quite popular and everything. But what I found is that I've if there was an easy subject, I've done it. So yeah. it became quite difficult to put every like for a while I was able to hit the two weeks again because I got an editor to help me out. So at least like he could do the editing while I was doing the writing and filming in the next video. But even then with an editor, I can't keep up two weeks. So I try to do every three weeks. But, uh, you know, mm. I, I'm also looking at it to be like, like, what am I doing here? Uh, like, I, I don't know. I I I don't want to I don't want to make this a, like a, a job that consumes all of my time. I want to. I want to put out videos that I'm proud of. So I'm sure. really trying not to stick to the schedule, although it is every basically every three weeks right now. That's the um, I think that's the challenge of doing it long term is there is this balance of like you want to make things that are meaningful. You want to make things about uh, subjects that are important to you and that, you know, yeah. um, are <clears throat> worth the time and everything. But algorithmically, you got to keep feeding the machine and. Yeah. And it becomes a job, you know, it's, I, I, I feel like I have a lot of other YouTubers on, on this, on this podcast and it, it all eventually turns into, you know, shop talk about like how hard it is to be a YouTuber, you know, and some, some guy that's a roofer. And, we have it you know, so tough. Yeah, I know. I can work anytime I want on any project I like. It's yeah. rough, man. I don't understand. You don't know my pain. <laughs> Well, it's funny that you mentioned like skipping weeks or like how you keep to a cadence. Like I've, I've actually been weekly since like 2015. That's impressive. Actually, for once upon a time I was doing two a week for like a couple of years I was doing two a week. I don't even yeah. know how I did it now. Um, but, uh, I skipped this week. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be revamping my set here and everything. So, um, I'm kind of taking it a little bit easy for the next couple of months and just, I'm, I'm going to be posting every two weeks, but, uh, yeah. this was the first week that I was skipped since April of 20, 20 or 2019. There was yeah. one April that I just took a month off. Nice. And it was weird how long it took me to like, it took me most of the month just to like catch my breath, just to like get off that, that to that cycle and be able to just like, I'm going to watch TV now. <laughs> oh. I mean, it's okay. Is, this is okay. I, I spend a full time job amount of time on the channel right now, and I sure. could definitely um, outsource more of it and spend more time on it, and I could really like do the grind. But I'm really trying to avoid that. I don't know. It's a little different for me because I'm quite a bit older than the average YouTuber. Same. I feel like the <laughs> um, yeah. I feel like the uh, how'd you do, fellow kids meme every time I meet yeah. up with YouTubers, but. Um, I've already been through a whole career. Um, so I'm not like starting out in my 20s and want to turn this into something. I, I'm kind of like, I'm actually okay if this becomes my retirement. I'm mm -hmm. kind of cool with that, actually. Yeah, that's kind of um, where I am, actually. Yeah. So you have to think about like, I have to think about like, what direction do I want to go? You either go like a, uh, like a Wendover Productions, where Sam keeps a cadence and he keeps lots of projects going on and he has a, a team of people that he works with. Um, and that's certainly one way that could, uh, mm. that I could go. Um, or we all trend towards H bomber guy where you put out one video once a year and it's three hours, 33 minutes and 33 seconds long. Um, so right he, now I'm, yeah. I'm trending towards H bomber guy, but I think it's going to be many years before I get there. But <laughs> he, I, I don't, I don't understand. Like I, I'm a fan <laughs> of the guy, but he'll make a three hour video about a sound in a video game. I know, and but it, it gets was millions good video, of right? It was it was an awesome video. That's the thing. Yeah, like I watched it. My my kids play Roblox, so um, oh, okay. I knew about the Roblox oof uh -huh. sound already. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I love H Bomber guy. I used to support his Patreon for years. I don't anymore because I decided I should. I'm going to put my Patreon money towards smaller channels. Oh, so okay. I, yeah. my rule is I'm not going to donate to anybody larger than me. Um, <laughs> uh, they so don't need my I don't, help. At, yeah, exactly. I'm not yeah. on his Patreon anymore, but I love H Bomber guy. I think his stuff is good. Yeah. So he could do it, right? I mean, he he can do it. Uh, but it's funny, like what he puts out is good. It's quality stuff, right? Yeah. But everything you're saying is exactly what I'm going through all the time. It's like, do I do I double down on just like putting out more content, or do I scale back and be like, I'm going to put out once a month, but they're going to be bangers. You know, they're going to be yeah. some big thing that I travel for and everything. 
Um, and I'm kind of in this weird transition period in my channel right now. So um, we'll see what winds up happening and everybody out there shudders. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing I'm trying to do and the thing I've been trying to do for the last about two years. So my channel took off to say the least. I mean, it, 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 yeah. it hit uh, 100,000 subscribers within the first uh, a little less than than 13 months. Um, which which is impressive, and then it's yeah. going to hit a million in, in the next few months at, at the current growth rate, uh, which is crazy. And, and it's, of course, it's become a thing. And I see references to my channel all over the internet. Certainly, like it, it's funny when I'm reading like a, a uh, Reddit thread on front page, and I'm just like going through it, and then suddenly someone starts talking about whatever transportation or cities, yeah. and someone then says, "Oh, you got to watch this video," and I'm like, "Oh, okay, I'll watch that," and I click on it. It's mine. Like, oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, but uh, one of the things that I've been trying to do for the last uh, year and a half, two years, is I'm really trying to promote other um, channels because sure. I, I've decided I don't want to be the only big urban planning channel out there. Uh, and, and there are others, the ones that are big. City Beautiful is pretty big. Um, Adam something is not all urban planning, but he does it as well. And yeah, he's actually so just yeah. recently hit a million subscribers. Um, but I have decided I don't want to be like the urban planning channel. I want to be one of many large channels. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really, really, really trying to promote some other channels. And there's been a few um, that I have promoted. And I don't think I'm solely responsible for this, but I've at least tried to like raise their profile. A few of them have gone past 100K in the last few months, like RM Transit, um, uh, Alan Fisher, and, um, and City Nerd. Who City just, Nerd, uh, recent, uh, yeah, City Nerd recently joined Nebula. Uh, RM Transit joined ne Nebula a few months ago. Oh, yeah, um, cool. So I'm really trying to like, uh, you know, if you go to my YouTube community tab, um, and I do recommend people check it out because the YouTube algorithm does not show community posts nearly often enough. Yeah. But on my U YouTube community tab, every few days I'm posting a video by some other uh, urbanist creator or a creator who makes an urbanist video. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I'm really trying to like spread the love a little bit because That's I good. kind of feel like I have enough views and subscribers right now. I'm actually doing all right. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to spread it around. But also coming back to the conversation of where the channel goes, people ask me all the time, can you make this video, that video, whatever, <laughs> fine. Can you make a video about my city? Um, I totally don't want those emails, honestly, because I have a list of 200 of video ideas yeah. that could literally last me years. I am not uh, running out of ideas. But what I do like to do is all these other creators are creating those videos, right? Like mm -hmm. I get people who are saying, oh, you need to make a video about, you know, whatever. You know, Alan Fisher is now has moved to Philadelphia. So he's like, he's making videos about Philly. And that's fantastic. And that's mm -hmm. great. It also means I don't have to. Um, you know, City Nerd, I still can't believe he did this. He moved to Las Vegas to live car free for a year. Just for fun. He's <laughs> now, actually. It's been a year now. But yeah, so he's made some videos about what it was like to live in Las Vegas um, uh -huh. car free, uh, which is also great because then I didn't have to make that video. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, I get people uh, who send me videos yeah. all the time and like, you need to make a video on this topic. And I'm like, but there, there it is. Like, yeah, why do I need to is, make right? it? It exists. It's no, right I get there. That you too. Know? It's like, oh, but I want to see your take on it. I'm like, Okay, but yeah. you know, I don't know. I feel like um, I feel like I don't want to be the only big voice in online urbanism. Mm -hmm. I have a certain uh, a very I have very opinionated uh, videos, very opinionated. Because at the end <laughs> of the day, my my channel is more of a opinions channel than it is an educational channel, mm -hmm. because it's based entirely and almost every video has some element of my personal experiences, places that yeah. I've been or things that I've done is a very common thread through every single one of my videos. Um, so but but that's only one point of view right like we decided the netherlands was the right place for us to live and that's certainly not the right answer for everybody and there's lots of stories to tell and so i really do encourage people and when people say you know like oh i live in i don't know brazil and you need to make some videos about brazil i'll be like no actually you may need to make some videos about mm. brazil right because you live there you know what it's like you know it way better than i will yeah. Um, but also when it comes to videos, I have um, I have two rules. Um, one of them is that uh, I have to actually go to a place and, and film it myself. Mm -hmm. I'm not making any videos about um, about uh, a, a city that I haven't actually gone to. Um, and and it needs to be about my personal experience. So when people say, like, you know, make a video about some place, I'm like, I, I have actually been to a lot of countries, mm -hmm. like over 60 countries. Sounds like it. So uh, I have been to a lot of places, so I could make videos about places I've been. 
But a, there's a lot of places I haven't been to in 10 or 20 years, and I don't think it's a reasonable thing to do. Um, so people, for instance, say you got to make a video about Japan, and I would love to make videos about Japan, and I will. But they've been basically closed for COVID for the last two years. Mm. Um, but that, but I really do want to stick to that so that when I make a video, I'm not just going to do it based off the Wikipedia article. I'm not going to do it based off what I read on Twitter. Uh, I want to go there myself. I want to experience myself. I And because I've been to so many places, I can contrast that with what it was like when I went there, you know, 15 years ago. Sure. Yeah. Which I also think is, is useful um, to know and useful to talk about it too, because a lot of the... A lot of the topics within city planning are uh, are about the changes that happen, you know, because mm. the only thing that's consistent in a city is that things will change. Nothing will ever stay the same. I know as much as the NIMBYs might try to keep it that way. That's, <laughs> it's fundamental. Cities are always changing. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, so I, I really do want to stick to it. And I think the thing that really solidified this in my mind is I made a video about Paris. So I had read about the changes happening in Paris. There, um, uh, their mayor, Anne Hidalgo, is making all sorts of changes, removing cars from all sorts of streets and areas, pedestrianizing things, making bicycle paths, making bicycle paths that are excessively wide just to prove a point, just to say, like, this used to be two car lanes and now it's a giant bicycle lane. Deal with yeah. it, yeah. <laughs> um, which is really which is really amazing um, to see. Um, but I had read all this stuff about it and I could have made a video just based off what I had read and other people's footage and stuff like that. But I decided to go there. Paris is not far. I just hopped on the high speed train and I was there in a couple hours. Um, and I met up with um, with Altus Play, who is a French language channel about cycling in Paris. And he showed me around. And my experience was like totally different than what I had read on on Twitter. Uh, I I would have made a completely different video if I had gone there myself. Hmm. Um, so not it, only in, in what the, way. So the changes that are happening are very localized. Okay. Uh, and when you see video of Paris online on Twitter, it's always almost the, always the same intersection that people are filming because okay. there is one place where there's a ton of people cycling. And it's very hit and miss outside of that. Um, so there's some fantastic things that are being done. And then there's other parts of the city where it's really, really scary to be out there on a bicycle. And I think the you know, the, the Twitter clips that you see really paint a bit of a skewed picture on that. Mm. And I think um, if I hadn't mentioned that, it would have done an injustice to it. Because one of the things that happens when people see things about other cities online is they're like, oh, every other city is doing these wonderful things. My city's doing nothing. But uh, every city is doing like projects here and there. Um, every city is doing that. Mm. And so if you just see the cool projects that a city is doing and nothing else, you get you don't really understand that like how does this all fit together what's really important is like y you can put a really beautiful bike lane down one of your streets and it'll be fantastic and it makes for some good pictures and video but at the end of the day if it's not interconnected if there's not like mm -hmm. if there's not a like a a whole city approach to things then it can the the reality of it can be very different and i think that's what's most important and i don't think that really comes across um, well, well, you know, when you get a tweet with a with a few pictures, a before and after, right? Look at this; it's yeah. wonderful. But then, you know, the the next street over is 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 horrible, um, and and that's not always the case. I mean, there there's some places like um, like I would say Oslo, for example, where actually there's lots of great stuff happening. It's happening all over the place, um, but uh, there's other places where you know they they've they've put some investment into one particular place, and everything else is absolutely terrible. So. I think, you know, that holistic view is is important. And I'm glad okay. that I went to Paris and I'm glad that I met up with someone who knew what they were doing, another creator who I could also promote. Uh, but um, so that I could I could see the good and the bad and the stuff that hasn't been touched at all. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the end um, yeah that was uh that was a uh, oh that was an interesting ride i was also altus gave me a bike to ride which was very nice of him but it was a super cheap chinese e-bike that he had been given for free by a chinese manufacturer and it was a piece of garbage and so i was riding this absolute piece of garbage bicycle through a bunch of streets i didn't recognize through like i was like oh it was it was stressful uh, but it was good that's why he wanted to get rid of it <laughs> oh here's a sucker Exactly. Maybe it'll get run over and then the bike will be a write-off. <laughs> um, 
going stepping back for just a second you're, you're talking about city uh, city nerd a second ago um and i don't know his name um his name is ray ray yeah okay i hope that's right otherwise it would be really bad uh, but Anyway. Well, um, I was watching his channel last night. Actually, I, I just r uh, ran across a video about um, it was it was something about like the uh, best walkable cities in America for the, the for the money or something like that. Yeah, I think that um, was his most recent one. Yeah, that's okay. a good one. Well, so my uh, wife that and I actually, like it. Sorry to interrupt, but that yeah. was an example. That's something that people ask me. That's a video that people ask me to make uh, all the time. It's like, okay. can you tell me? Like, I can't move. Tell me where I should move in the United States, and then. You know, city nerd goes and makes it. I'm like, perfect. There. <laughs> Thank you. Stuck out of my community <laughs> post. I said, people ask me to make this video. Thankfully, city nerd made it for me. And then I send everybody there. Yeah. This is great. This is a win win for everybody. He exactly. gets more views. He gets more subs. I don't have to make that video. Everything's mm. great. Anyway, carry on. Well, what you were saying earlier about wanting there to be more people covering this kind of topic. I mean, you can only do so much. You know, well, and, exactly. And, and this is like a movement. And we need to get as many you know voices out there as possible. So I agree with you on that. Um, but no, like my, my wife and I, we, we talk a lot about like finding a more walkable place to move to and stuff. Um, and so I, I ran across that video and I shared it with her and I, <laughs> no, this might have to get cut. Um, he, he seems very stoned <laughs> just in the way he talks, you know, cause it's a good city <laughs> and there's some good places to go, but you know, um, that's my well, I, I, don't, I don't know uh, what he does in his off screen time uh, to be honest but uh, <laughs> but I do like um, I do like how like absolutely straight he plays everything and he does yeah. these incredibly sarcastic jokes yeah yeah exactly he's very dry straight face the entire time yeah. and I love it so yeah. much I don't say yeah, that to make fun or maybe a little bit but but it was just <laughs> it, it just kind of cracks me up just how she's just like yeah you know yeah so I shared that video with my wife and I was like, this guy's super stoned, but this is a cool video. <laughs> um, yeah. The one thing with all the, all the cities that he recommends is they they all cold. They all have winter. So uh, you do have to put up with that. Yeah. Well, if you're that's moving true. From Texas. Yeah. Yeah. And we keep talking about like, you know, cause I've lived my entire life in the South. So maybe living up North might be interesting, but then like, you know, it's, it's snowing right now and it's just like, I'm, I'm wearing my hoodie indoors. Cause it's just, it's too much. It's like, it's like 60 degrees in the house and I can't, you know. <laughs> that really nice. reminds me, um, for some reason when, when you get these, uh, when you get these, uh, these Americans coming into my comment section being like, you know, a bunch of wimpy cyclists and, uh, uh, you know, I'd rather drive my truck and, <laughs> And it's so funny because I'm like, yeah, we're the wimps, the ones going out in the rain and the snow and yeah. like, you know, all, all year round. That's right. We're, we're the wimpy ones here. It's but. a lot more difficult to pull yourself up into a raised, you yeah, know, exactly, Silverado. Right? It's really tough, man. You yeah. know how high those F-150 Raptors are? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I wanted to convey a story just real quick um, yeah. about what happened in my own neighborhood. Um, uh, so I live in East Dallas and it's a fairly liberal part of town for, for Texas, you know, and, and, um, that's one of the things that we like about it. But like, um, this is maybe six months ago or so they started talking about putting a bus stop like in our neighborhood. And you would have thought that, that they were talking about putting in an open like nuclear mine or something, yeah. you know, and yep. like everybody, like they had you know community forums about it and they like you yeah. know accosted the the transit person about it and everything and everybody was up in arms because people were going to be walking through our neighborhood and stuff you know we're not saying what yeah. kinds of people or anything but but it was um, like you mentioned NIMBYs a second ago yeah i've been in those discussions yeah it's 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 very much a nimby thing it's like everybody's all for it until it's you know actually in your in your neighborhood yeah. and then they don't want anything to do with it and i remember being like I was like, isn't it interesting how not one single person was like, oh, thank God, there's a bus stop in our neighborhood. I can take the bus now. Yeah. Like, nobody thought that at all. Because, like, in this part of the world, anyway, getting out, I'm just going to put it in the most coarse way possible. Getting, taking the bus means you're poor. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, a lot it is of a social stratification that there. Is, that is the way it is. Yeah, that's what's been done. So I feel um, like to, to break through... Um, and, and, and make it more popular. Like you, you have to get through that identity thing. Yeah. Before you can even get people to, 
to take Well, the it. thing is, if you live somewhere car dependent, um, then uh, a car is the best way to get around. And I think a lot of people confuse that. I, I see this all the time in discussions. They confuse the fact that a car is faster than public transit to the fact that cars are faster. But the U.S. has spent trillions of dollars on making cars faster. Cars are not inherently faster. I mean, obviously, on a racetrack against a bicycle, a car is going to be faster. But yeah. even even in you know places like Los Angeles, there's there's YouTubers that have done this before, where you know one person's in a car, another guy's on a bike, another guy's on the subway or whatever, and and the car comes in last because you know there's traffic and everything. But mm -hmm. but yeah, cars are only faster um, because billions and trillions of dollars have been spent on car infrastructure, and there's been a huge disinvestment in public transit. Right. Um, and also the land use has been done to favor cars and not to favor transit. Um, and so in a lot of places in the United States, you will only take transit if you're desperate. I mean, you're either too poor or you have a disability that, present, that prevent, prevents you from driving or your car's broken down. Mm -hmm. Like that, those are the only reasons you would ever take a bus. Of course you would, because it's an inferior mode of transit. That doesn't mean that transit is an inferior mode. It means right. that transit in a car dependent place is an inferior mode. But the, I think but the is, perception. Yeah, the perception. So I think this was one of the things that blew me away the first time I went to London, England. Because I'm from London, Ontario, Canada, which is a very suburban place. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and it's the same thing. Like I took the bus when I was a teenager. It sucked. Um, you know, the schedule said it would come every 45 minutes and it would be nowhere near that schedule it would be plus or minus 45 minutes and then yeah. two buses would come at once it sucked and so as soon as i got my driver's license i was done taking the bus right and of course i thought the same thing back then that the bus was only you know transit was only for poor people mm -hmm. and then here i am in london england and i'm on the bus in central london and a guy steps on wearing like an armani suit and he's got a rolex on and he gets on the bus of course he gets on the bus. It's the fastest way to get around. Mm -hmm. Like, like that's that's all there is to it. Like he he didn't. Um, the the bus is not for poor people in London, England. The bus is the easiest, most convenient, fastest way to get around. And fundamentally, people. Um, and this is one of these things I've learned about all the cities that I've lived in and visited all around the world is that um, you know there aren't really that many car people bike people transit people in the grand scheme of things um the vast majority of people and i mean really vast majority of people will take whatever method of transportation is the fastest way to get around mm -hmm. the most convenient way to get around and that's it there's very few people who will ride a bike in a car dependent place there are people who do it they're like kind of crazy in my mind you know they really love their bicycles it's dangerous but they'll mm -hmm. do it anyway no matter what um and then there's some people who will drive into the center of Amsterdam, even though that's an incredibly stupid thing to do, and they end up taking much longer than if they had just parked their car at a park and ride and taken the metro in. There are some people that will still do that. But actually, the number of people that will do that are small. Um, I'm personally a, a tram person. I will take a tram, even if it's slower, because I love sitting on trams. I think they're <laughs> the most wonderful way to get around. You can look mm -hmm. out the window and see everything. But anyway, so I would still take the streetcar in Toronto, even though it was slower sometimes than something yeah. else. But, <laughs> well, but anyway, even, even if it is slower, it's you can oh, it's more, get out yeah, your work. It, you, you can, can read. Sit, you, you can, can read, right? You, yeah. yeah, exactly. And so I, I used to read a lot on public transit on my commutes. I loved it. I would read so much. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. and, and there is an element of that, too. Yeah. So I think the thing is, with this idea in the United States that only poor people take the bus, I mean, that's certainly not the case in other places. I mean, if, if you go to Tokyo, um, everybody takes trains, right? Yeah, everybody yeah. takes trains and buses. Of course they would. Why yeah. would you not? You'd be stupid not to. And I think that that culture will change as transit gets better. And I think that's already the case in some places in the United States. I mean, if you go to Manhattan, that yeah. you see all kinds of people, even though... And I, and I think, actually, this is one of these issues that Americans have. Like, we talked earlier in this conversation about how American culture and, and the country itself is very insular mm. um so you don't have a lot of reference as to what happens outside of your country and i think when americans think about cities and transit they think about new york city and new york city is is the best city in the united states when it comes to like walking and and transit for sure by far 
Mm -hmm. uh, like it, it's so funny. Whenever whenever I see these urban planning like statistics things in the United States, there's always you know these states, and then suddenly the one bar graph is huge for New York City. <laughs> it's always the case. New York's this weird outlier in the yeah. United States. But I think, um, but there's a lot of problems with New York City too. Like New York City has way too many cars, like way too many cars, and um, and the roads are way too wide. It's really loud. It's it's polluted. The public transit system is filthy. It's been underinvested for like decades, yeah, seventy, eighty years, and and it and it's kind of shit at times. Like it yeah. it rains and it floods the subway station. You know the the subways are dirty. They've got graffiti all over them. Like it is kind of shit, and um, and there's reasons why that. Again, it's due to a lack of investment, um, and there's all these political reasons uh, um, and different levels of government that need to invest in these things that have favored cars. There's Robert Moses, who bulldozed huge amounts of New York City to run, you know, freeways through it, which are now all crumbling. So mm -hmm. you're seeing that come up in New York City. But I think my point here is, is that a lot of Americans look to this and they hear what I say in my videos. And the, but the only like the only thing they have in their own experience is New York City or mm -hmm. their local downtown, which is probably crumbling and, you know, it's completely falling apart. It's got homeless people living there yeah. all over the streets. So that's what they think of when they think about the walkable neighborhoods and public transit. Um, and obviously, as I said, a lot of that comes down to the fact that there have been very car centric policies that have been put in place across the United States for the last 70 years that have destroyed downtowns. There's been a criminal uh, lack of investment in public transit and basically all of the money has gone to car infrastructure in the United States. So again, yeah, I mean, cars are better because there's trillions of dollars spent. If you'd spent trillions yeah. of dollars on public transit, people would be taking public transit. Um, so yeah, they have the, uh, the Americans have this trouble with what do they think of? What's their, what's their, their, um, their, you know, what what ties them what is is the memory of of being in somewhere with good public transit that's walkable and it, and it's not necessarily a good experience and even the americans that have been say to europe have only ever been to the touristy areas right so i'll get people say things like oh well europe can only do it because they have these old medieval streets and i'm like no that's just where your cruise ship dropped you off you know like <laughs> most european cities were built since the 1960s right yeah. like most of the area around them and we have we have this whole um island flavoland here in the netherlands that was built that was reclaimed land it was built in the 1970s the cities were incorporated in the 80s and they're not like car infested shitholes so, yeah. so i mean the, yeah it's it's i think americans do have that trouble um but again back to your original question about people thinking only poor people take the bus i mean that is probably true where they live um but i think that's why uh and, and, and that's why public transit needs more investment mm -hmm. uh to make it faster and i think that cult that culture will change and i think it changes pretty quickly because i even see it like in toronto um where, where when i first lived in toronto in 2000 versus when i go there today um there is a different attitude towards public transit there now there's still lots of Canadians who say exactly the same thing that public transit is for dirty poor people and whatever. Yeah. But I think like as public transit gets better, um, people will take it. Cause again, there's not that many car people in the world. I know people say like, Oh, I'll drive all the time, no matter what I'll drive. But the, the truth is, no, they won't. If, if driving is slower, some of them will not drive anymore. And so you can do this with like transit with its own right away, right? Subways are the obvious thing, but you don't always need subways. You can have bus rapid transit that has its own lane that speeds by all the mm -hmm. all the stopped cars, right? You can have you can have uh, LRT and uh, tram lines that that are faster because you know they have to stop for people, but they don't ever get stuck in traffic. And I think that's um, I actually made a video about this many years ago. Um, about buses stuck in traffic. I mean, as long as public transit is slower than cars, nobody's going to take it unless they're desperate. Mm -hmm. But as soon as public transit is faster than cars, then some people will take it. And some people realize like, what, what am I doing? Why would I drive and yeah. get stuck in traffic for an hour when I can take the, you know, the BRT or I can take the LRT and I can, I can be there in, uh, in half the time. And that's when the culture starts to change because, you know, it's the same thing with cycling. 
um, and I've, I've talked about this before in videos, where people think, oh, you know, why are we building these bike lanes for cyclists, you know? And they think of cyclists as, as these, well, the, these kind of admittedly kind of crazy people, the people who ride mm -hmm. a bike no matter what, right? Who, even yeah. though it's dangerous, even though everything's far, even though there's tons of cars everywhere, they still ride a bike. And those yeah. people are kind of crazy, I think, you know? I mean, I, I wouldn't do it. Um, but it, as where the I live, yeah, safer, you have to be a little bit crazy. Yeah, right. I think you have to be a little bit crazy <clears throat> to do it where you live, or desperate. I mean, that's the other thing. Mm. There's lots of people in America who, you know, they can't afford a car, um, and they have to get to work anyway, so they're going to ride the bike. Yeah. So that's the that's the association people have with with cyclists. Um, but you know, as the streets become safer, uh, and as it becomes more pleasant to ride a bike, more people start doing it. And it's a lot harder to hate cyclists when, you know, a bunch of your coworkers do it and your sister does it. And like, you know, there's suddenly it's 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 a lot harder to do. And I think, again, I, I don't think you need to change that culture first. I think that culture will change. Um, but, you know, building transit out to car dependent places is is a tough sell, yeah. period. Yeah. It really is. Well, the whole um, um, it feels like a self-fulfilling prophecy, the whole like only poor people ride the the bus. Um, so, yeah. you know, so then they, you know, people don't invest in the bus and then the only people who ride it are the poor people, <laughs> you know, it just kind of yeah. like, you know, makes it, makes it happen. But so. that's exactly it. Right. And it, it really, really does come down to a lack of investment. Um, and that's, that's, it's, it's really that simple. I mean, when you, when you look at, and then this is one of the other things, people have no concept as to how much stuff costs. If someone's proposing a transit project or a bicycle lane. You'll see people up in arms. I can't believe we're spending fifty million dollars on bicycle lanes, right? But they have no concept that like every traffic light they pass costs a hundred thousand dollars. You know, there'll there'll suddenly yeah. be a, a a new off ramp built, and that that will cost hundreds of millions of dollars. They have no concept as to how expensive car infrastructure is. Well, I was going to ask: um, um, Are there numbers? in terms of like you were talking about a second ago, like roads have to be resurfaced constantly yeah, and about every 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like, is there, are there numbers to show like how much maintenance of say a light rail requires versus roads? Yeah. Strong towns has done a lot of this stuff. Um, a lot of these numbers and that's like what I said, they, they come from a fiscal conservative point of view. Um, yeah. And, um, and so they do a lot of numbers stuff, but uh, what, certainly when you look at light rail, it, it's expensive to build, but it's very cheap to operate compared to any other type of transit compared to buses. And the infrastructure lasts a ridiculously long time. It yeah. really does. Like rails last a very, very long time. They don't get um, worn down the way asphalt does. And uh, and so that's one of the reasons why, um, well, more places should be building LRTs. That's light rail transit for people yeah. that don't know the jingo, but um, <laughs> basically trams. Um, uh, they are more expensive uh, up front, but then over, you know, they'll last 50 years and um, and uh, and they just keep the and and the costs just keep getting cheaper and cheaper. Um, and roads, uh, I mean, it really depends on how much um, traffic there is and how much heavy traffic, especially trucks, um, are driven over them. It the pretty much every road needs to be resurfaced every 30 years. Um, but it can be earlier. It can be as early as even 10 to 15 years if mm -hmm. a lot of, of heavy traffic is going over it. And that's what a lot of uh, American cities are seeing. And that's what Strong Towns is all about. That um, even when you talk about building a road, the real cost comes from the, uh, the maintenance of that road. Because right. even a lot of the time, uh, cities will have it set up so that a developer comes in and builds a neighborhood. And then there'll be development fees that go to building the road. And that's fine. So the road is kind of free, if you will. Mm. There's usually city costs in there as well, but it's being subsidized by the development. But then the amount of tax that's collected is nowhere near enough to recover the replacement cost of the infrastructure. And that's what American cities are seeing. So mm. when a neighborhood is about 30 years old, there needs to be a big chunk of money put up. And it's usually more than building it in the first place, because usually that road is important and it needs to be kept open. And so mm. they'll close one lane and keep yeah. the other lane open. And, you know, you know, how it is. you've seen the construction, it's everywhere. Right? Yeah. So it costs more to replace that infrastructure than it did to make it in the first place. And once you get to like 50 years, you need to start replacing your water and your sewer infrastructure, your buried electrical cables. Um, and that stuff's expensive. And um, and certainly the suburbs of America don't come anywhere close to collecting enough tax revenue for that. Um, and that's where the whole Strong Towns thing comes in. So, yeah, I mean, uh, 
when it when it comes to transit too, there's also the I've and I've talked about this so many times before, but I've made a whole video on it that transit needs to come with good land use. So when you build, say, a light rail line, um, you also to make it successful, you you make walkable neighborhoods around it. Um, you make yeah. mixed use walkable neighborhoods around it. Those are inherently more self sufficient financially than car dependent places are. Uh, and and that light rail is what uh, is is the wealth multiplier, as Strongtown says, um, mm-hmm. to make those places possible. So those places, you, you know, you see this all the time when some light rail is built. And light rail is better than buses in this regard because there will be a bunch of development along. It. People will want to live along the new light rail line. Right. You know, condos will go up, new shops will go up, all sorts of stuff, because light rail is seen as more permanent. Right? It's a lot harder to just suddenly turn off the tap one day. You've got a bunch of rails going out there. And so then you get all this development. You can take advantage of that development. If the development is done correctly, then that development will also be um, positive to the city financially, which you know then can go into the transit and the transit can go towards building more great walkable neighborhoods. And, and you get this, like, this nice uh, virtuous circle where things just build and build, build wealth. Um, and that's what Strong Towns is all about. It's mm-hmm. all about how these places build wealth. Now, you know, we talked about very, very briefly at the beginning of this conversation about DART in Dallas, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And I remember that video that I made about bad land use (laughs) used a DART station as the um, as the thumbnail because, you know, (laughs) they go and they build these this light rail line. But then when you get there, it's just a parking lot or it's just the side of a highway or something like that. Right. And that's where um, that's where transit becomes expensive because that transit is not acting as a wealth multiplier. It's dumping people off at a parking lot or the side of a busy strode or something like that, or the side of a highway. Then, you know, then it just becomes a cost. And then when that, when that uh, light rail needs maintenance, you know, where are you getting the money for that? It's not coming from the places you've enabled by that light rail line. If you just Mm. surrounded it with, um, with parking lots. And I think this is one of these things that the U S really screws up when it comes to transit, because, Transit works best, rapid transit especially, where if you, you get off the, the transit vehicle and you're immediately somewhere walkable, you're immediately somewhere where yeah. you can walk to your destination. That's where it really works best. And like unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, yeah, exactly like New York. When you step out of a subway station in New York, there's a million things around you, right? Um, there's a whole bunch of people that live within a five to 10 minute walk of that subway station. There's a whole bunch of shops that you might want to go to. Um, I said, and I said in that video, and, and it's funny, I also did a Strong Towns podcast after it, and um, and Chuck brought brought this quote up because he said it's just so ridiculous that this is the level of conversation. But what I said in that video is that when you build public transit, public transit needs to go from the places where people live to the places where people want to go. Like, but, th- but that Wait. seems to be lost on people? <laughs> like... <laughs> This episode is also brought to you by Kinker Boy. Um, so look, I know this is a little bit personal, maybe a little uncomfortable to talk about for some people, and you might be one of them, but some people, like myself, unfortunately, get canker sores. Not to be confused with cold sores or fever blisters. Those are the things that cluster around your lips. That's something else. That's herpes simplex. Canker sores are inside your mouth. They're round, they're red, and they make eating feel like just a hot poker being shoved into your face. They're super painful, and they can swell up to the point that you can barely even talk. Most of you probably don't get them, but those who regularly do, you, you know what I'm talking about. Now, this is something I've suffered with my whole life. It's a family thing, unfortunately, but along the way, I did stumble on a solution and that, that actually helps. That solution is Canker Boy. It's a vitamin supplement you take once a day, and it helps keep down your body's overproduction of inflammatory cytokines, which is actually the root cause of recurring canker sores. It's been on the market for about five years now. There's a ton of positive testimonials on Amazon. Everybody's different, of course, so your results may vary, but most people do experience a reduction in the number and severities of their ulcers within two to six weeks. So if you're one of the poor souls who deal with canker sores, it can't hurt to give it a try. Uh, Just go to cankerboy.com, that's C-A-N-K-E-R-B-O-Y.com. There you'll find a link to buy it on Amazon, but we also offer it as a subscription, where if you sign up using the code CONVERSATIONS, you'll get 60% off your first two months supply. There's also plenty more information on there if you have questions. So once again, it's cankerboy.com. Go check it out and live life pain-free. Now, back to the show. But what, what that means is that like, you need to have a, like when you build a, a rapid transit station, you need to have the the zoning available so that people can build a bunch of mixed use yeah. stuff around it. That means that you're going to get a bunch of transit riders there, right? And then at, 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 
that then you'll also be either somebody's house or somebody's destination, or maybe both. But um, but so often what you get in in the United States is you get car dependent places that are built only for cars. And then as what always happens with car dependent places, there becomes a huge amount of traffic. And eventually the traffic just becomes unbearable, right? Yeah. So you've got like, like a four lane strode um, that, uh, that becomes completely bogged up every single day. And so then what's said is like, oh, geez, what are we gonna do about all this traffic? Um, and it's going to cost so much money to to widen this road or to build a bypass or whatever, and we can't afford that. So why don't we put in some transit? And that's so often the conversation I see in the United States and in Canada. It's like transit is only considered once things have become so unbearable <laughs> be, uh, after it's been built for to be only for cars. And unfortunately, transit doesn't really work that way. You can't just apply it like a Band-Aid, right? You can't mm. just like throw in a bus stop and say, oh, okay, everyone's going to take the bus now, you know? when that bus still gets stuck in the same traffic as the cars and when you get out of that bus stop and you have to cross a huge parking lot to get to anywhere you want to go. I mean, that's that's not the way it works. What you have to do with transit is you have to do the land use that comes with it. If you're going to build a transit stop, you have to then say, okay, people are going to step out of this. There should be buildings right there that they can go to. There should be, you know, uh, a, a, a uh, an apartment building or a, a townhouse right there. That mm -hmm. people can live in, um, and and unfortunately, that's not what's what's done so often. Yeah, that, that's that interesting. transit that's is not, applied like a band aid. Yeah, that's not a that's not part of the conversation that that I hear very often. Uh, I find that land use discussions and transit discussions are completely separate in yeah. the United States, and that's people talk about transit as again, it's like it's like we know we've heard the, the Europeans have told us that transit can help tra car traffic, so let's apply transit and problem solved. <laughs> But no, it, and it's and it's so frustrating, and I see it all the time. Even um, in that video, I talked about um, this city, Mississauga, which is one of the largest cities in Canada. It's right next to Toronto. It's a suburb of Toronto, effectively. Mm -hmm. And I lived and worked there many years ago. Uh, and they built this this BRT bus rapid transit system that cost them uh, five hundred over five hundred million dollars. It's beautiful. The stations are great. They're really fantastic, and and it's completely separated from traffic. It's everything a BRT system should be. It's actually, I'm, I, I still think it should have been a tram, but whatever. It's fantastic. Uh, but when you step out of the stations, you're often just at the side of like a six lane road. And, you know, yeah. then there's a giant parking lot and then there's a building down. And it's like, okay, guys, like you spent half a billion dollars on this, but who the hell's going to take this instead of driving, right? If, if it's such an unpleasant environment that you step out into, it's such a car centric environment that you step out into it really seems like a waste of money. And that's where I think transit projects in the US and Canada really fall down because they're just applied as this sort of like overlay to mm -hmm. car centric planning. Mm -hmm. And again, when you design, when you've put all your money and all your effort and all your land use into designing for cars, you, you can't just like magically get everyone to switch to the bus or to the tram or to the, you know, the LRT. Uh, it's, it's a much more I mean, you need the land use to go along with it. And I think that's, I think that's a waste, waste of money. Because again, beautiful transit, lots and lots of money. But is that transit really going to pay for itself? Is that is that going to is there going to be a positive ROI there? And I think as yeah. long as it's applied as an overlay to car centric places, then the answer is no. Hmm. Interesting. Um... <laughs> I know this is this is the thing. It's a, this is a conversation that has never had in America. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. So, so we've been going for a while, and I know you're not feeling great, and I want to give your your voice a rest. But um, yeah, you can clearly talk about urban planning, city planning stuff all day long. I, I could, I could literally talk about it all day. Well, I like to give people a chance to talk about something that they don't normally get a chance to talk about. So is there any, like, are there any rabbit holes you've been going down recently that have absolutely nothing to do with what you normally talk about? Like anything that's just like, <laughs> got you excited, but you never get to talk about it because you're always talking about trains and bikes. Yeah. You know, it, it's really funny because, um, because like, as I said, I don't have a background in urban planning. This is just something that interested me because I wanted to explain why all these places were so different and why did I like some places and hate other places. And I am interested in it and I can talk about it for ages, but 
But the really funny part is like, I never watch any urban planning content <laughs> at all. Uh, occasionally, uh, I actually find City Nerd is the one I watch the most, but because yeah. uh, I think he's as sarcastic or even more sarcastic than I am. But um, but I don't watch a lot of urban planning content. Because he's so relaxing to listen to. <laughs> all right. I'm going to start. Doing uh, but uh, uh, I generally avoid it. And it's really, really funny when I'll put out a video and someone's like, oh, you're ripping off this video or you got inspired yeah. by that video. And I'm like, no, I totally do not watch this stuff at all, guys. Yeah. Um, I, I generally go back to the topics that always interested me and why I went into engineering. I either watch like uh, like stuff, hardcore stuff about semiconductors and electronics or I um, or I watch uh, stuff about like quantum physics or something like that. Hmm. Because I did take a bunch of quantum physics courses in university, um, but but what uh, what's most interesting to me is that um, I, I'm mostly watching stuff now that my uh, that I'm trying to get my kids interested in. Mm. So it's not so much for me anymore. You know, now that I have kids who are um, nine and twelve, especially while well, my twelve year old is becoming a teenager and doesn't want to learn anything from his dad, but uh, but oh. my nine year old is still quite interested. So. So lately, we've been watching a bunch of uh, a bunch of stuff about um, uh, science related stuff, mostly. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we're watching like Sabine Hossenfelder or something yeah, like yeah. that. Um, yeah. And so that's that's kind of the, the stuff that I'm into. And and it is really funny to look through my YouTube watch history. And it's almost entirely things that have nothing to do with urban planning. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I, I almost wish I could make a channel about like other stuff. Maybe, maybe someday in my it, when I when I approach H bomber guy status, <laughs> I'll start a channel where uh, where I make videos about whatever. Yeah, just the random thing you you found that day or whatever. Yeah, exactly right. I feel like most of the YouTubing that I do now is just like, for lack of a better word, comfort viewing. It's just just stuff to have <laughs> on in the background that you know I can kind of sort of ignore. Um, randomly I've, I've gotten, I don't want to say I've gotten into, but I seem to watch a lot of videos from this, like, uh, this hoof guy who like treats oh, yeah. cows hooves on, he's like <laughs> from Scotland and he, and he like, you know, does that, like, he's like carving it out and sometimes it's really gross and there's like pus coming out or whatever, you know? So there's a little oh bit of a God, gag factor, but, else. but it's just the most random thing. And I just started watching it and he's, he's got this Scottish brogue when he does the thing. And it's just, I'm just like, huh, oh, I don't know. It's, I don't know how I there's a uh, I do appreciate the Scottish accent. My grandmother was Scottish. And so, um, you know, I'm actually pretty good at decoding the Scottish accent because of that. Yeah, because I always uh, spent so much time with her growing up. There's an electronics uh, YouTuber called Big Clive that I watch sometimes who's Scottish. He lives in the Isle of Man, but he's Scottish and uh, uh -huh. he's great. Um, and he's in terms nice. of like random things, there's a there's a German guy that I've watched for years called the post apocalyptic inventor. And he does these <laughs> things where he goes to a scrapyard and he buys stuff like that's been clearly thrown out. But he knows the good brands, like the really quality brands mm. of of uh, electronics. And this is usually like industrial level electronics in Germany from, you know, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And he he identifies like well, this is a good brand. This is like solid components, and he'll buy it for scrap, and then he takes it back to his shop and he repairs it. And I find those videos just absolutely fascinating. And I, I feel like that guy should have way more views, but it is a little bit niche, I guess. But yeah. it's just fascinating to watch him like literally take garbage, scrap out of uh -huh. a scrapyard, and he's like, no, I recognize this is like the you know the German company such and such that went out of business in 1982 and no, that's fascinating. And, but they, they were like they they made the best whatever motors uh -huh. or whatever uh, that you've ever seen, and he brings them back and he tears the whole thing apart. He finds like the one piece that's wrong, the one piece that's gone off, and uh -huh. uh, and replaces it or forges his own or whatever, and then puts it all back together. And it's yeah, kind it's of really the, a restoration video. Yeah, restoration video, but of like of like high quality industrial electronics from Germany. <laughs> from a specific time period. <laughs> no, it's really good. He, he repairs all sorts of stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great. That, I have many issues with the internet, but one of my favorite things about it is that like there's, there are so many people that get into such specific niche things yeah. and, and can like share that with the world and, and get other people interested in it or just have other people get fascinated by the fact that somebody out there cares this much about this weird specific thing. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's pretty great. I think it's fantastic. I mean, I think that's what's so great about YouTube mm -hmm. because I think if you look at any of the Nebula creators um, and there are no bad creators on Nebula, actually it's one of the things I love about Nebula. I've, Aren't I've we also great? Of, um, 
<laughs> I've gotten in the habit of uh, of loading it first before YouTube. Yeah, and I, I have try too, to actually. just like like click on things that uh, that I wouldn't normally watch that the YouTube algorithm would never give me. Mm -hmm. And I know on Nebula, like maybe it's not all for me. At least I know it's going to be well produced, a nice uh, you know, it'll be a decent piece of content even if it doesn't necessarily interest me. But I've also found stuff just browsing that did interest me, and I never thought I would would enjoy it. Um, but what's what I always find interesting, I think about sometimes is that like there's all these channels on on Nebula, some of them, which, you know, on, on the YouTube side have millions and millions of subscribers. But if you were to go and pitch them to a TV station or even a streaming service, they'd be like, no, nah, nobody's yeah. going to watch that. Yeah. Are you crazy? Like, there's no way anyone's going to watch that. You, you, you'd never get that out there. And yeah. yet, you know, when they're when they're given the opportunity to just be on the Internet and find their niche. They can get literally millions of people watching it every single month, mm -hmm. and that's great. That's yeah. really great. And in, and in your case, you they can start a movement that <laughs> changes the world, or at least uh, brainwashes people in a certain way. I guess, but well, yeah, brainwash I mean, is a strong a good, word. But, good, you, know. you know what? I, I I feel a little bit bad to the people I orange pill because they do <laughs> never see things the same again, and then they they went from, you know, being happily ignorant. Um, <laughs> to uh to suddenly miserable mm. um but at the same time like it's better they find out earlier in life than later you know yeah. so so it's good and then a lot of good stuff is coming out of it there's there's people who there's lots of people who have moved to europe because of me not just to the netherlands but all over the place oh, wow. lots of people that have moved to europe uh, and I've, I've received those messages many many times there's lots of people who moved within the united states i hear that constantly there's been nebula creators who have mentioned on our on our chats that they're like, yeah, I, I moved to this area, this uh, this part of the city because of your channel. Um, hmm. And that's also fantastic. And there's been people who, as I said, have gone into urban planning because of me or they've gone into engineering because of me. Um, they've gone into uh, uh, advocacy because of the channel. And that's mm -hmm. really great to see. So I think you know, that's fantastic. Um, not to minimize your part in all of it, but I, I do kind of wonder a little bit, maybe we can kind of close on this, but... Um, uh, with the pandemic and the way everybody's felt so separated and everything, I wonder if that is leading people to want to go to more walkable city areas where there is a more sense of a community. Do you think Possibly. that's part of it a little bit? Um, although I found that, um, you know, a lot of people in the suburbs were very smug uh, when the when the lockdowns came along because, they, you know, what one of the one of the things that that happens in American suburbia and Canadian suburbia is that people try to recreate the entire world in their own little fiefdom oh, sure yeah. so like instead of going to the public park they'll have a climber in their backyard they'll have their own pool they'll have like their bar in the basement instead of going to a bar you know mm -hmm. so they really try to create the world in their own little you know their own little castle if you will their suburban castle and there were a lot of uh suburbanites that were very smug about that to be like haha you know new york city's all shut down but i've still got the bar in my basement i've still got my pool you know where i can drink by myself yeah like and a winner so, and, and the there were a lot of people who were like, you know, cities are dead now. You know, no one's no one's going to commute anymore. Hmm. No one's going to the office anymore. We're all going out to the suburbs. I'm so glad I live out here. Um, so, but uh, so there was certainly that effect. And there were people that moved, you know, when they lo no longer needed to go to uh, into the office all the time. They did go move out to the big house. And when everything was locked down anyway, the city did seem kind of like sad like mm. why am i living in this little tiny apartment in the middle of the city when like all the restaurants are closed and all the shops are closed like this sucks to have to be locked in this little apartment like this so there was kind mm. of the opposite element that happened there but but as i said at the beginning of this conversation there was also the element of suddenly there are way fewer cars and suddenly there are you know outdoor patios where there weren't yeah. before and you know it's it's winter and we were always told nobody's going to eat outside in the winter but actually they just put out a heater and some blankets and lots of people come out so i think there was that element as well that yeah. people started to see like you know a lot of uh, the covid cut through a lot of the excuses that you get a lot of the uh um, you know the people trying to maintain the status quo. You can't maintain the status quo anymore with, more yeah. with COVID. So a lot of projects happened that were, you know, that urban planners had been talking about doing for years, but just couldn't get over the line. As soon as COVID happened, then suddenly they could close off a street to traffic and make it only for walking, cycling, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And people saw the benefits of that. And yeah, and as I said at the beginning of this conversation, uh, my channel certainly had an element of good timing to come yeah. along <laughs> at that time when people suddenly realized this and then went 
and then spent too much time on YouTube. And we, we all saw this big jump in views during yeah. COVID when people are locked inside. They go on YouTube and suddenly they see my channel explaining to them all of the reasons why their city is better now when they yeah. reduce the amount of car traffic. I like what you said earlier, though, like you put a vocabulary to something that they were feeling but didn't quite yeah. know what it was. I think I think yeah. that's a, a key. I get thing. that from people a lot. They really yeah. say these are all the things I've been thinking, but I didn't have the words to express. Them. <laughs> I think, and I think that's where that's where things have yeah. really resonated with people. Well, that's cool. Well, I think it's a good place to end. Um, yeah, I'm glad we got a chance to do this, Jason. And I'm sorry it took that's so good. long to, to set it up. It was like we started talking about this like six months ago. And yeah, and then. And then I saw you a few weeks back. It's like, we really need to do this. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Right well, no, no, thanks so much for having me on. Um, totally. I'm happy to come on any other time. Um, and we can talk about, uh, you know, the, the second time I come on a podcast is often my favorite because we talk about something that's not me and my channel. So, yeah. Uh, that's yeah. always fun, too. Well, we can go into a third hour if you want. And we can get into that. <laughs> No, I should I should be getting to bed. I've been sick yeah, all week. Yeah, it's kind of so late for you. No? I'd, I'd be very happy to uh, to sleep this off. Well, maybe I'll make it out to Amsterdam sometime. That'd be fantastic. Once again, I want to thank Jason for coming on the show. Um, I got to hang out with him at a YouTubist event recently, and uh, I thought he was a really cool guy. And at one point, he actually um, had to step away because he was doing an interview for some European news channel. So I know he's a busy guy and he gets asked to talk about this stuff all the time. So I'm just glad he took the time to do it with me. I, I really did enjoy it and I hope you got something out of it too. Now, before you go, um, I am in the mood of selling my wares today. So uh, you always see me in nerdy t-shirts on the show. Well, you might not know that all of these shirts are for sale at my store, answersofjoe.com slash store. So there's branded t-shirts with my logo on them. There's also posters, mugs, stickers, a lot of different fun and nerdy designs that have got nothing to do with my logo. But, you know, it might make a good gift for somebody or wear it yourself. Um, people always tend to get a lot of attention when they wear them from other people that are of the same mindset. So you might make a friend. You never know. So, yeah. And it plus, it really does help support the channel. So it's answersofdoe.com slash store. Go check it out. Have fun with it. This episode was produced by Kimmy Britt, edited by Bray Brown. I'm Joe Scott. You can find me anywhere at Answers with Joe on all the socials. Of course, my YouTube channel is Answers with Joe. Anyway, thanks a lot for listening. Please do share this if you thought it was interesting and a nice review on whatever podcast player you're using right now really goes a long way. But until next time, thanks. Have a good one. Now go out there and start some conversations of your own. Take care.